Welcome to In Conversation with. Today we're going to be talking to Dr. Jim Shuck of the Imaging and Man Manipulation Facility of the Molecular Foundry. Now for those of you who aren't that familiar with the Foundry, I see a lot of people have never seen the Foundry before. Um, so, I think it's really good here. Um, the imaging facility is on the ground floor of the foundry. So if you go walking down that corridor, you'll see a lot of posters that describe Jim's work. Now when Jim first agreed to do this, I did a little bit of background research on him. And in addition to finding out that he's a karaoke fiend and a trivia hound, I also found his professional webpage. And on his webpage, he has a short paragraph that describes his research interests. So if you'll bear with me, I'd just like to read to you Jim Shuck's professional interests. My primary interests are in the field of nanoscale optical imaging spectroscopy. The research objective of this lab is to develop and apply new nanophotonic systems for the investigation of physical, chemical, and biological processes with nanometer, nanometer scale accuracy and sub-picosecond time resolution. These new ultra-sensitive spectroscopic probing modalities will use linear and nonlinear contrast mechanisms as tools for better understanding condensed phase and biological structures in the quantum and single molecule regimes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so by applause, how many people understood what I just read? Okay. I didn't ask for this thing. <laughs> You guys, when I read this, I didn't really understand a word of it. But I'm hoping by the end of today's conversation, we're all going to have a better idea of what it is that Dr. Chuck does. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jim Chuck. <laughs> Good thing we're on the mic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I know that... Um, Talking in front of a live audience can be just a little nerve-wracking, as opposed to talking in front of corpses really easy. Um, mm -hmm. So what I did was um, I sort of invented a little warm-up game that I thought we could do. You didn't tell just, me about that part. You know, it'll be fun. It's going to be fun just to get you comfortable in the space. And this is, this is in your right. sweet spot, okay? Trivia and karaoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here sweet. we go. Uh, name a Madonna song from the 80s. Um. Like a virgin. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Who sang yeah. Little Red Corvette? Prince. Right. Okay, now here's a tough one. Not the revolution. Uh, you can't hear us? All right, wait, wait. Yeah, oh. I can take care of that. There you go. Better? Okay. Prince. Well, so far, Prince. he's answered all the questions correctly. So, okay, but this is the tough one. Uh, how does Ludacris pronounce Usher in yeah? Persia. Ah, I knew you get it. Uh, Excellent. Persia, How, yeah. who, who knew that? Nobody, right? It's just, yeah. just us. Okay, yeah. great. He, um, he has okay. the beat that makes it well. Who or what is secretary? The horse? Yeah. Oh, a horse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get it. You, you need to host the next trip. Yeah. Pub quiz. Okay, I'll, I'll be there. Okay. So, how are you feeling? You're warmed up? I'm good. Ready to go? All right. Sure. Well, okay. I was really wishing that my usual sort of uh, smile to waist ratio was about this size. <laughs> I'll work on it. Okay. More biking, right? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, Jim, where were you born? I was born in San Diego, California. And when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? And be honest, because I know the answer. Um, I wanted to be a truck driver and a baseball player. And why was that? <laughs> it could, so that I could drive myself to the baseball games. <laughs> Practical from the beginning. Yeah, sure. Your maternal grandfather was an aeronautical engineer who mm -hmm. helped design the Voyager satellites. That's right. What do you remember about um, your relationship with him when you were growing up? Well, he, he liked to tell me science stories, which I, which I liked a lot. Yeah, he, we would, uh, we'd go and walk around Caltech and he'd tell me about Feynman. Um, yeah, and, and the satellites are, are in the Smithsonian, though he would never go and show them to us. I, I'm told because he was, he, he was too modest, which was probably true. Um, he also liked to tell a lot of stories about how he and his uh, fellow engineers and scientists were constantly putting ones over on, uh, on the administrators. Uh, and, oh, no. And the bureaucrats. Oh, yeah. so Jerry, should we be worried? 
the Jerry's Remember, Pizza. this is why it's hard to put one over on Mikkel, right? <laughs> <laughs> Scientist and administrator. By the way, would you like some coffee? Oh, yes. I, I, okay. I I'll help myself. Okay. Can I pour you some? Oh, I got it. Thank okay, you. Sure. Uh, where did you go to high school? Uh, I went to high school and at a high school called uh, Clovis West High School in Fresno, California. Oh. Well, you once said that you, that you spent your life following college around. What did you mean yeah. by that? <laughs> Uh, that's true. Well, I guess probably uh, one of my, my earliest memories was in family housing at, uh, at UC Irvine, where my mom was uh, getting her degree. I point over here, my mom's in here. Jim's mom wave. <laughs> um, and so then... Yeah. How did that change your research interests? 
Well, that was, yeah, so Roger sort of gave me my, my science break. Uh, he let you know, me sort of snot his undergrad into his lab to play with things and mostly break things and actually ended up spending most of my time up here at the uh, ALS. Uh, and so he, he is a true like, laser jock and optics guy, so he got me into shooting light around. And, uh, and so yeah, that's, that's kind of where, where that interest really began. Cool. And then you ended up doing the graduate work at Yale with Bob Grover. Yeah. Uh, what piece of it? Life advice did Bob give you? Uh, <laughs> Bob, gave me, Bob gave me a lot of advice, most of which I, uh, I can't be here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, he also told me, though, that he said, he said uh, make, basically take advantage of your postdoc years because they're the best years of your life. It's all about being a postdoc. Was he right? Those uh, the best years of your life? Um, well, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and, yes and no. I mean, he was, what he meant was that it's when you get to, you, it's like the one time in your career where you actually, well, you kind of know something. And you get to focus really on one problem. It's your project. Uh, and, and you get to spend most of your time thinking about it. Obviously, as you move on, uh, then you get to have a larger impact, but you're, you're not as uh, working in depth on that sort of thing. And, so it was, you know, it was pretty good. If you don't mind living below the poverty line, I think postdocs great. And you did go on to do your postdoc at Stanford. Yes. How did that come about? Yes. I shut that. How did you end up at Stanford? Uh, well, that was it. Was really pretty simple. I was at a talk at the uh, American Physical Society March meeting, and uh, a guy there named W. E. Werner, who, who does single molecule optics. And Physics and spectroscopy gave a talk that I thought was really cool, and the very last slide was uh, looking for postdocs. <laughs> I've got one for you. <laughs> so, what kind of research did you do at Stanford? Um, so, uh, so I looked at, I looked at single molecules, small things. It's where we really started getting into, I guess, what they call it, nanoscience uh, and nano optics, um, and then began working on on ways of of trying to better funnel light down into small things like uh, like single molecules. That's what led to my research here. Nano Nano -optics. Nice. So throughout your years of college, graduate school, postdoc, did you ever consider quitting science just walking away doing something else? Uh, uh, just between the two of us. Not really. Not really. No one else I do. <laughs> so, as we mentioned, you work um, no. in the imaging facility yeah. of the Molecular Foundry, which is a nanoscience research center. So, just for all on the same page, can you define um, nanoscale uh, for us? Yeah. You happen to have a slide. <laughs> <laughs> it's magic. Oh, okay. All right, so, so, right, so we might as well start off with, with nano, right? Start from the beginning. Uh, so, so, a nanoscience refers to the size of the objects that we look at, which tend to be on the uh, nanometer scale. Uh, a nanometer happens to be one billionth of a meter. The prefix nano happens to mean 10 to the minus 9. So it's a, yeah, a, a, a thousand billionths, billionth. What does that look uh, like? What is it? <laughs> In relation to something that we a kilo kilo. Um, so what is the threat? So so okay. So yeah, right. No, most people aren't think, used to thinking in terms of nanometers. Yeah. Uh, so here is going to give you some idea. So uh, a typical cell in your body uh, has a size that's on the order of between one and ten microns. Uh, here I show a virus is sort of hundred nanometers. Proteins tend to be on the order of the, uh, ten nanometers. Uh, DNA DNA can actually be very very long, but it is typically on the order of one or two nanometers in width. Uh, so, so a piece of DNA is sort of a nanometer. And then, of course, you have atoms that are even smaller than nanometers, which is a whole other realm of science. But maybe to give a better idea of what I do. Uh, something that most kind of small thing that most people are used to think about are, are human hair. So a human hair tends to have a width of about uh, 100 microns. Uh, and so to give a better idea of, of sort of the relation between a nanometer and a, and a human hair, uh, let's see here. So a human hair, or a nanometer is, like I said, a width of 
DNA. Uh, if, if a human hair, you imagine human hair was the size of a football field, then uh, a nanometer, or your, your width of your DNA, would be like the size of a sesame seed sitting here on the school, uh, after a hungry lion and tomato or something. <laughs> so, so, that's it's, yeah, it's a lot smaller. <laughs> uh, so, this idea of um, nanoscience and a nanoscience research center, is it parsed up in sort of individual research units? We hear all the rhetoric about cross-fertilization of ideas and collaborating on projects, but is that really the way it is? Um, uh, so yeah, actually. I mean, I'd say, as it, as it even says here, right, uh, nanoscience is, is inherently multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Um, The main reason for that, I guess, is that, well, uh, it's, it's really at the intersection of pretty much every uh, scientific realm, uh, scientific discipline. Um, and, and so, and that's because, well, if you think about like high energy physicists or even uh, chemists, uh, they're really used to thinking about uh, atomic particles, subatomic particles, or even molecules, which are made of a few atoms, very small things. And they, I would, I would argue that scientists understand those things very well. Um, on the other sort of end of the spectrum, you have uh, people like uh, uh, biologists, these some types of biologists, uh, and like condensed matter physicists who study big things, all things, crystals, like silicon, big piece of silicon, uh, or you know, trees, if you're a biologist. And again, I'd argue that they know these large scale things very well. But sort of where the two fields meet, I where the two fields meet, uh, or where all of these expertise, where what's not understood is how things work on a scale that's bigger than atoms and molecules, but smaller than some bulk crystals. Uh, and, and so that's... So you kind of touched on this, um, but it seems like the reason people want to study things at the nanoscale is because properties change depending on whether you're talking about bulk quantity or right. Right. Uh, atomic. But what, what does that mean when you talk about like properties change how? Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, so up here, let me give you an example. So uh, think about coal. I work a lot with coal, so this is an example for me. Um, uh, most people are used to thinking about coal sort of on this size scale, big, huge chunks of coal sort of on the, here I said it's sort of a 10 centimeter size scale if you have to work at four knocks. Um, <laughs> Uh, then you can have, then you can have people also see gold flakes around, whether it's you know, in, I don't know, the Sierra Nevadas in, in the rivers or in your uh, beverage of choice. The uh, so those flakes tend to, uh, you know, they tend to be out sort of like millimeter scale in size. And really, the flakes in this and these gold bars actually uh, behave about the same. They have the same physical properties. If you were to, uh, you know, attach electrodes on either side, you kind of get the same currency, resistance, things like that. Um, but then you can start making chunks of, of gold even smaller. So up here are, are some uh, scanning electron microscopy images of gold spheres that are about 100 nanometers in size. And you can even get gold even smaller, which is just a few atoms. This is a, an atomic cluster of gold. It's even smaller than a nanometer. And uh, what you begin to see is that, OK, so for, for big pieces of gold, and by big, I'm sort of defining it as really kind of greater than micron or greater than 100 nanometers in size. Uh, the material properties remain constant. As soon as you start shrinking down the material, uh, the properties change. And so as an example, here are a bunch of vials that have uh, gold particles in them that range in size from about 100 nanometers to 10 nanometers. And you can see that they have very different colors. And the colors change only because the size is changing. Uh, and you can also manipulate the colors a little bit by changing the, the shape of the particles. And so, uh, let's see what I have on the slide. So, right, so this is the reason this is exciting then is because now we have a knob to tune material properties uh, to, make, to give you properties that don't exist in, in, in nature or, or are hard to find in nature simply by adjusting something like, like the size or the shape of the material. And so, then this can give you, uh, you know, the idea is that then you would find properties that can help you solve some of the, the, the world's bigger problems. Like Energy shortages or uh, medicine related things. Or, 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 that's right. But you have to be careful because 
Uh, you can also make properties that you don't understand and that are, are bad. I mean, that's, you have to, have to pay attention. It could be used. <laughs> Let's say before Chimshot, how do people usually look at things this small? <laughs> uh, let's see here. So, Romans. All right. So that's right. Excellent question. Uh, <laughs> and so there, there are really two ways that people used to study small things, right? I mean, again, nanometer is very tiny, sort of getting close to atomic scale. Um, there, there are two classes of, of imaging and microscopy. The first uh, is what people call scanning probe microscopy. The second is uh, our electron microscopy. Uh, let me talk first about scanning probe microscopy. Um, so, so a good example of a scanning probe microscopy, the idea behind scanning probe microscopy is you take some, a nice sharp tip or probe and you bring it very close to the surface you want to study and kind of drag it around. So a, a good example is, is, is an atomic force uh, uh, micro an atomic force microscope, or an AFM. And the way an AFM works is actually very simply a very long sort of diving board cantilever that's really sort of macro in size. I mean, you can look at these things and see this long cantilever. And at the very end of the cantilever, you usually put a very sharp tip. These tips can even be close to atomically sharp, depending on the conditions. And you take the tip, and you just start dragging it along the surface. And if it sees a bump, it goes up. Sees a valley, it goes down, and you drag it around, and you can actually make images of this of this roughness. And if your tip is very sharp, uh, then you will get uh, if your tip says a nanometer sharp, you will get nanometer scale resolution of what you're imaging. Um, I actually uh, so I don't know. I like, uh, we lowered the shades because you can actually look at it in the foundry. But uh, the reason that the molecular foundry is defined or it is shaped like it is is so that it. Uh, can sort of in an abstract sense resemble uh, an atomic force microscope probe. That's why it has the candle behind it. But it does not have a tip. Yeah, or it did. Right? <laughs> 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 Unless it's April Fool's. There's not a tip that he's ever used yet. He was just finishing with the architects. That's right. Some people. <laughs> it was all neat and small. <laughs> Um, so that's one way. So scanning probe microscopies. The other way are, are electron microscopies. And basically, you know, in an electron microscope, people are sort of familiar with these. They, you shoot electrons at something, and you end up getting pictures like this. Uh, uh, so again, both the reason people use these techniques to study small things is that uh, they gave you very high spatial resolution. You can, if again, if done correctly, you can get down to atomic spatial resolution. So here is something that's called a quantum dot. Uh, that's imaged in a, a transmission electron microscope, and you can actually see the individual atoms in that image. But when, you know, I hear very sharp tip and electrons, and it seems like these things can be evasive or destructive. I mean, could you uh, destroy a sample with a very sharp tip? Yes, you can. Actually, that's right. So, so, so that's that's sort of the problem, right? Uh, uh, these two two techniques can be very invasive or destructive. Uh, again, you have a sharp tip going down and poking at something, I don't know, let's say you want to look at cells, chances are it just pushes right through. Not good. You start dragging it and it tears holes. Or an electron microscope where you have these, these charged particles that have mass and you're curling them at the surface with very high energies, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of, uh, of electron volts. Uh, and so this can certainly be damaged to the surface. Plus there are other problems, like an electron microscope you have to have a uh, conductive uh, substrate, so you have to coat your things with metal. So this picture, this flea or whatever here, has been coated with metal so that you can image it. And as I think I even picked this image here, this is an electron beam going in and doing some imaging, but you can see it also is creating a huge trough in the surface as it drives along. So yeah, it certainly can do damage. So um, you're an optics guy, and it seems like there's no discussion of optics talking about diffraction. So I think we should probably get that over with now. And <laughs> the, the diffraction. You can okay, find sure. people uh, what the diffraction limit is. Why is it the problem? Yeah, yeah. All right, I, I know I have a slide here, so over the shoulder. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so light uh, is a wave, or can be thought of as a wave, actually. There are two equally uh, 
correct way of thinking about light, either as a, a particle or a wave that would go as a wave for this moment. Particle soon. Uh, the, the idea that there's this, this law in physics that says if you have some a wave, you can't concentrate or focus the wave down to a spot that's smaller than approximately its wavelength, um, which is really what this equation here says. Um, and so, uh, so that means you can't really resolve things. By resolve, I, yeah, I mean sort of image things with their actual sort of form. Um, that are, you can't resolve things that are smaller than approximately the wavelength of the, of the light that you're using to, to try to image it. Uh, so this big white spot that I have on this slide here, uh, I mean to sort of represent a diffraction limited spot. This is sort of as tight as you can focus light down. And the issue is that, you know, work in the foundry. Uh, and in the foundry, they make nano things. And that's, that's what I'm interested in studying. And the problem is a, a typical nano thing, like a quantum dot, is the size of about that black dot right there. Right there. Um, and so you can see here that, right, there's a big problem. You have a big mismatch here between the size of your, of your light that you're focusing down. And, and it seems like you get a lot of noise. If you're looking right, for a dot that small, right. how do you know what you're um, so, so, exactly. so the problem is that so if your light spot is this big and you're trying to interrogate this little guy here, uh, so the little guy might, might give you some signal back. It might shoot your light at the, this, this thing and it might reflect some back or, or absorb and fluoresce or something. But the problem is that usually your particle isn't sitting in, in a vacuum in the middle of nothing. It's sitting on a surface. And so there's a lot of other atoms and things sitting around here that can also reflect the light back and give you uh, a signal that isn't what you want. It's basically noise. And so uh, it becomes very difficult to study nano things uh, with light uh, for, for, for that reason. So um, you once said photons are fantastic. <laughs> and uh, the photons are also light, right? So light can be a way more work. Uh, and photons also have no mass and no charge. So it, it seems like light would be a good way looking at very small objects. You're yeah, right, right. So, uh, Except this little diffraction thing about it. Well, yeah, but yeah, that's right. I mean, I think in general, you, you, know, you, you said it. Photons are fantastic. I see that you said it. So a photon, so, so I told you light can be thought of as a particle or a wave. A particle of light, uh, quantum, electro quantum electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so, um, it, it's, it's called a photon. So for sort of all intents and purposes in this talk, right, a photon is light. That's, that's light. And they are fantastic because uh, relative to the other nanoimaging techniques that have been used for a while, they're still very much used, um, photons are relatively non-invasive and non-destructive. Uh, in fact, I would say, so when I talk about light, is kind of the kind of light I'm interested in. It's typically visible light, so the light we actually see. Uh, uh, so it's sort of very <coughs> tactile to me, I guess. Uh, nothing to get me interested. Um, and so, so visible light tends to be uh, relatively low in energy, um, and so and it, and it can tra and it can go through a lot of things without doing much damage. So it is non-invasive and non-destructive. Into but, what you use photons as probes. But you still have to deal with the diffraction of the problem. I mean, how is that been That's right. That's right. So it's, you know, actually, as I'm looking at these pictures here, uh, I can mean, I go so far as to say, I mean, kind of give you a feel for how much, how important these properties are to, uh, about light, non destructive, non invasive. So I'd say that light microscopy is still really the workhorse behind all, or nearly all, biological uh, studies. So this is a picture of. Uh, fluorescence image of, of I forget what uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a fly testing or something uh, or inside one and then here for example are, are some uh, fluorescently labeled uh, HIV uh, viruses that are in, in monkey cells and so light microscopy is, is really just used a ton even though it has this diffraction problem however I mean, why, why, why even do no, no offense why even do AMM and TV and all that stuff when you have photons right <laughs> So, so the problem, the main, you know, the main reason, of course, uh, 
here is, is this whole diffraction limited problem? That really people want to, are you know, very interested in knowing properties of small things, and you can't always do them with light. Uh, but that's, that's sort of where, I guess, my research comes in. Okay. So, so right, the diffraction limit is, is a big problem, and I would say that uh, uh, you know, it's been a big problem for a long time, as long as there's been light and lenses. And so, of course, I'm not the first one that wants to find a way to beat the diffraction limit, right? and there's in fact been way, uh, ways to do it that have existed for, for many years now. Probably the most conventional way is something that's called near-field scanning optical microscopy, and so on. Uh, at least if you're from this side of the Atlantic. The other side of the Atlantic, looking for stuff. Oh, it's called snow. <laughs> uh, I like snow. So, but the, the concept of near field scanning optical microscopy is actually very simple. So, uh, imagine that you have a, a metal sheet, thin sheet of metal, and you poke a tiny hole, very tiny, much smaller than the wavelength of light. Um, something I realized. So, again, I told you we're interested in. in visible light. It turns out that visible light has a wavelength on the order of a few hundred nanometers. So that that's kind of gives you an idea. We want to look at nanometer things, but we have this wave, these, these light photons that have wavelengths of a few hundred. Um, imagine you poke a small hole in your piece of metal that's much tinier than the wave of, let's say, 50 nanometers, say 500, and you shine light on that metal screen. Well, as you might guess, most of the light hits the screen and just bounces back. But if you shine enough light onto the screen, eventually some light leaks through, leaks through that tiny hole. And it goes through the hole. And of course... Diffract out again on the other side. Yeah, right, right. So as soon as it comes out of the hole, it, it, uh, it quickly diffracts out. Again, sort of what your intuition might tell you. As soon as the light comes out of the hole, it diffracts out. But if you go and look very close to the hole, so right where the light's coming out, and you want to measure the spot size of that, of that light spot, um, you'll see that the spot size is determined not by the wavelength of light anymore, but by the diameter of the hole. That has basically the spot size is the size of the hole. And so, for a little bit of time, this is as long as your sample is very, as long as what you're, you look very close to that hole, you have a sub diffraction limited optical spot. And that's or, or what we call a near field spot. Uh, so the way that, that near field uh, probes are actually done in real life, they don't take a big metal screen and put a hole in it. Uh, they actually take something called a, you know, they take an optical fiber, which you can easily shoot light down. It's a waveguide. Coat the whole thing with metal, and then poke a little hole right at the bottom. And then you can bring this little tip very close to the surface so that it, the light doesn't have time to diffract out. And then you can kind of drive it around on the surface and get optical uh, information with, again, sort of uh, uh, resolution that's on the order of a spot size. But uh, it's, 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 it seems like. You're losing a lot of light, though. Mm. The amount of light that you're putting into the tip is not equal to the amount of light you're getting out. That's right. That's right. Actually, yeah. uh, well, so that's exactly right. So because so light doesn't like to be squeezed down in these small places, uh, it, it, it's true that it, you shine light down the hole, uh, most of it comes back. In a typical near-field probe, one of which is shown here, I don't know if you can see that little hole right at the end, um, has a, a sort of a diameter. Uh, the whole diameter is on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers, and they have optical throughputs of about one per million. So for every million photons you send down, one leaks out the, out the other side. And you can imagine this is a huge problem for imaging because that means you're not getting very much signal. You're not even able to probe your sample very much signal. That very much limits the samples you can look at. Isn't the whole size of problem too? That sounds kind of big still. Right, that's true. So yeah, yeah that's, that's right. So this is. Uh, 100 nanometers, and again, we still want to look at sort of things that are between 1 and 10 nanometers in size. So, still not even ideal. It's better than just what you get with the, the lens, you know, magnifying lens, but, but still not great for our purposes. Yeah. So, these are good efforts, is what you're it's saying. Good <laughs> um, but um, what you do is for the next generation, is there, is there a better way of um, using photons? So, yeah, at least, you know, in our naive minds, we thought there was. Uh, and so the idea, again, is, is relatively simple. Uh, we had, the, the question we asked is, can you make an antenna for light? And so the reason we asked that question, 
that this is the fault. Uh, is the fault. The, so most people are familiar with the idea of antennas. This is a uh, sort of a typical radio wave antenna that's used to sit on top of people's houses. I guess everyone has cable now. Uh, and here's sort of another radio antenna that sits on your car. Um, the idea, the idea is that that radio radio waves are actually also light. They're just much lower in energy, and they have much longer wavelengths. Wave wavelengths are typically on the order of a meter uh, to, to even a kilometer. And so, but the nice thing about these antennas that are sort of sticking out everywhere is that if you shine a radio wave anywhere near that antenna, it very efficiently grabs the radio wave. Uh, and then it takes all the information in the radio wave and concentrates it to a very small area. So in this case, you probably can't see it. There's a little black box right here on the antenna. It's, it's a thing that's called a feed gap. Uh, and it, all of the radio wave information ends up in that feed gap. Or same with your car antenna. And so once it gets the energy to a small place, and then ultimately it, it takes the information and puts it in an even smaller place, right? It, it goes into the electronics that are inside your TV or inside your radio. So here's just a tiny... Now, this is an FM uh, uh, receiver, and you can see that that's, that's the head of a matchstick right there. So it's taking these meter-sized radio waves, uh, electromagnetic waves, light, if you will, but it has a wavelength of a meter, and concentrating it down to these sort of these length scales that, are, that as we like to say, are deeply sub-wavelength, sort of on the order of microns. And uh, so I was going to say, so and then the question we ask, of course, is, well, light? Invisible light is also electromagnetic wave, just like a radio wave, uh, just has smaller wavelengths. So can we, in effect, scale down the antenna so that it will just work for light? Can you? And, and, and the, the short answer is yes, uh, we can. And, uh, and so this is what one type of antenna happens to look like. This is, this is made here in the foundry uh, by Stefano and his group. Um, and so this particular antenna, there are lots of different antenna designs. I mean, you can make one that look like this, people do. Uh, this one is, is, is called a bow tie antenna. It tends to come out of uh, microwave engineering. Uh, I think the reason it has that name is relatively obvious. You have two triangles facing each other. Tip to tip. There's a small little gap in the middle. Uh, and these triangles now are, are small. They're gold and they're small. Uh, they tend to be usually 100 nanometers or less in size. And so this is... So, so the answer to your question is yes, you can make optical antennas, and this is what we've started to do. Uh, there is one caveat to throw on there, but um, the only way you really can make these work, though, is you have to take into account how the gold properties change when they get down to the nano scale. And so I think all of the like real physics that made this a challenge is sort of hidden here in this statement. But uh, the bottom line is, yeah, you can make antennas that don't work. And is there some reason why they weren't making these antennas, say, 10 years ago? Yeah, so, so the answer, again, is sort of hidden in this, in this statement here. It's that uh, they hadn't really realized the goal. To, they, they tried to design antennas for light. So again, the idea, also, we weren't the first ones to have the idea of making an antenna for light. It's just that uh, the goal prop has properties that change when you make it smaller. And you, if you don't take those into account, if you just pretend like the goal acts like bulk gold, like a you know, bar of gold, you're going to design your antenna to be the wrong size and wrong shape. And so that's kind of what we had to take into account, what we had to think about to finally get them to work. And so the way... So, so the way these work now, right, it's pretty simple. Here's, your, here's our diffraction limited spot, right? Uh, and there's our little nano thing right there. And so if you take, say, an antenna and you stick it in this diffraction limited spot, and I point out, you know, it's like a, a gold bow tie antenna, for example. Uh, I point out the antenna does not have to be as big as the spot. Uh, if designed correctly, the antenna essentially will suck in most of the light that's in the spot and end up concentrating all that light to a region that's right in the gap between the two triangles. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're working on. We like to say it improves the mismatch between sort of the macro and the nano. So the light, we're looking at it from the top? From the top. Okay. Um, and have, is there a real life application for this uh, sort of optical imaging? Yeah, so hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Oh, so it would be here. Oh, sorry. Four pictures. Four pictures. That's right. So, let me go back. 
So just to give you a better idea of how an antenna works, there's another bow tie right here. Uh, what we usually do is shine a laser beam right onto the antenna. Again, the light's sort of grabbed by the antenna very efficiently, unlike an ensemble tip, and ends up giving you a very strong, very localized signal right in that gap. And so the whole game here, right, is to make the smallest gap possible because then you have the smallest spot of light. And so this up here is a, it's a, uh, a simulation of what the optical, the optical fields around an antenna would look like if we shine the laser beam on it. You can see that the fields are by far the strongest right here in the gap. And what's, what's the distance between the two points? So in this, in this simulation, this is about five nanometers. Um, and we, and by we I mean Stefano, <laughs> can make them actually he can, he's made in 10 effect, I think the picture I showed before had it, it had, there's a gap size there of, of 4 nanometers. Um, reproducibly, we tend to make gaps up somewhere between 10 and 15 nanometers. Uh, and constantly trying to do that. So now it's time to ask. Alright. Applications. So sure. Um, so so uh, it's kind of a lead into applications, I should probably tell you that we want to take these light spots, and just like with the end zone, right, the near field scanning optical microscope, we want to make a probe that has a very tiny light spot that then we can drive around. And so, uh, I kind of you know, giving you an idea of how this works, we, we take something like a typical AFM tip uh, and put a bow tie right at the very end. And so now you can bring the tip down and you can play games. This is something that postdoctoral scholars, uh, Shiwe Wu and Alex have been working on. If you bring the tip down, you can get a very close to the surface without touching it, so you can be gentle. Uh, but now you have your little bow tie there, and you can shine your light down, hits the bow tie, the bow tie squeezes the light down, concentrates it to a little spot, and now you can drive around on the surface uh, and get optical information, but with uh, nanometer scale resolution. So that's, so, the, so then and we... That, and so this, yeah, so this is sort of to, supposed to be reminiscent of an enzyme tip, except now that we don't coat the outside with metal, uh, we just put a bow tie at the very end. So light can come down, an optical fiber will ultimately hit uh, your, your nano antenna, can give you a little light spot, a little intense spot right there. Uh, all right, so, so then we want to yeah, take these microscopes and, and, and do something with them. Uh, and so, right, so I work here at the DOP. Uh, we've got fat guys like, I guess, Steve Chu and Paul Posados, who have very much been into the uh, research of alternative energies. And uh, as, I, as I like to say, uh, you know, I've been here long enough that I drink a pump. So uh, I, it seems like a pretty cool problem to work on, one that, that I support. And so what one thing that we're trying to research that are, are uh, Biofuels, or how to make better, more efficient biofuels uh, out there. Um, so, so biofuels sort of have an interesting story. Uh, the uh, no one really cared about them much until you know gas suddenly uh, you know, cost four fifty a gallon or whatever. And because of that, people had, didn't study plants, uh, at least certain types of plants, in particular the cell walls within plants, very much because well, they're, they're boring. Um, and, and because of that, they don't, no one really knows how plants, of, particularly the plant cell wall, which is where most of the plant mass or weight is, uh, is held inside the plant. It's, it's sort of the, where it's, it's that mass that ultimately is going to be converted into fuel. Um, they don't know how these plant cell walls are put together at the molecular scale. And because of that, uh, it's very hard to break down the cell walls into, into say, smaller molecules that then can be fermented into something like corn ethanol. Uh, I put corn ethanol here because that's something people are familiar with as a fuel. Uh, people, I guess, in the field like to say that there are only two things wrong with corn ethanol, uh, the corn and the ethanol. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I've really heard about um, these kind of biofuels that it almost it takes more energy to make fuel. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, so particularly for something like corn ethanol, that's exactly right. It takes more energy, uh, or not more, but almost as much energy to break down and turn the stuff into fuel as you ultimately get from it as fuel. And so you know, people would like to be able to, to fix that, to find ways to better break it down. And the secret is in the cell walls, the plant cell 
the plant cell walls. That's right. That's right. So one thing we want to study then with our photons, localized light spots, uh, are plant cell walls so that we can learn again, again how they're put together. And because it's sort of a biosample, it becomes something that's sometimes more difficult to study with other uh, sort of uh, tools, other instruments that can give you the answer. Uh, all right, so yeah, so here I think I can show, uh, this is a rough picture of how you can see it. It's, it's, if you open up your biology book and you look and see what a, what a plant cell wall is supposed to look like, you'll see this and you figure they've got it all figured out. Uh, but, but it's totally made up. That's right. That's not totally made up. Yeah, but it's, but yeah, they don't. It's it's just a model. Which is, uh, there's no there's no proof that these are how things are bound together at all. And so we want to go ahead and essentially see if that that, that model is correct. Now. Uh, uh, all right. Plants have a lot of scales. <laughs> they could right. They're exactly. a bulk and. They are, yeah. So, so plants are really cool, exactly, because they exist on a whole, you know, a variety of scales. Obviously, from your know, plant on that sits on your desk or a tree in your yard, to exists at the meter scale. But then you go in and you look at say how much growth occurs every year. Well, that you kind of get that millimeter of growth every year. You can look inside that and see like single plant cell walls, and they are sort of uh, ten microns in size. So you can look sort of between the plant cell wall or the plant cells, and you'll see plant cell walls. Those are about typically a micron in size. But then you can look inside a plant cell wall um, and you'll see that there are there are substructures. Uh, things like uh, cellulose microfibrils and that even those uh, have structure inside them. Ultimately, in order to understand how these things are put together, you need to be able to image at the nanometer scale. And so that's that's what we're doing. But you also, to truly understand the plant, you actually have to be able to image at a whole variety of scales. But you're looking yeah. So what have you done so far? Right, so, uh, okay, so, here, so here's a slide. It's, it's somewhat complicated, but just ignore most of it. So actually, because people just didn't care about plant cell walls until recently, there's a whole lot of, as we say, low-hanging fruit uh, for the study of cells. So we've actually first just gone in and decided to study the plants, sort of the plant cell walls in general using regular diffraction-limited optical microscopy. So now, resolution is on the order of a few hundred nanometers, the wavelength of light. And uh, one reason, which I didn't really mention before, but one reason we really like to use light, besides the fact that it's non-invasive and non-destructive, is that light, if you shine light on something and, and you look at it, it, it generally can tell what you're looking at. Like, actually, what's, what the composition is of what you're seeing. Um, so your eyeballs are very good. It's very sensitive spectrometers, as one of my advisors said. But basically what that means is, you know, I can look at this podium and say, that's wood, right? Or I, I can uh, you know, look at this and say, that's uh, fake glass. <laughs> Plastic. Uh, and you can't do that with an AFM tip uh, or an electron number. So if you, if there are ways now to get some kind of sort of atomic information, uh, but getting sort of more, uh, more uh, complex Molecular information is difficult, but you can do it with light. And so, what we did here is we just went in and looked. We, we actually, uh, uh, Martin Schmidt went across the street from the botanical gardens, found a, uh, 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 talked to talked to the botanist there, and said, "I want to look at poplar." And they walked to the nearest poplar tree. She said, "This is the one you want." Chopped off a branch, uh, brought it back to the lab, cut a thin slice, and stuck it in the microscope. And then we shined light on it, and we we kind of looked at what came out because when you shine light on things. Uh, you can tell what you're looking at. First, we decided to, to see, we asked the question, where are basically the sugars in the cell wall? It's the sugar that, that most people want to turn into biofuel. And so here, the cell walls happen to be the areas between the black areas. And you can see that, that uh, your, your carbohydrates, mostly your cellulose, um, happen to be pretty evenly distributed throughout the cell wall, um, which, which is no surprise. Uh, but then you can do a different kind of optical spectroscopy um, and look at the same area and, and say, well, okay, we don't want to know what the sugars are. We want to look for something called lignin. People think of lignin as the glue inside a cell wall. So this is the thing that's so energy intensive, the thing that's hard to break down. Is that right? That's right. Well, that's what we think. That's it's, it's, it's right. Exactly. It's because you're sort of bound in this glue, it's difficult to take it apart. And so you have to ask the question, where, where is the lignin? 
And so if you look at this picture here relative to this one, you see the ligand also happens to be kind of everywhere in the cell wall, but it's most pronounced in the regions between the cells in, in, in the areas called the middle of the mellow. Um, and so actually we didn't think much about this because I'm you know, maybe the farthest thing from a biologist. Uh, it just seemed to make sense. The glue is in between the cells. Um, but no, we showed this to uh, Professor uh, uh, Chris Somerville, who happens to run the Energy Biosciences Institute on campus. And he saw this and he says, I don't believe it. You've got something wrong in your image, some artifact. There's no reason you have ligand in between the cells. Why should we go there? It's supposed to bind up the, the cellulose. There's no cellulose in the middle of the um, And we were a little struck because we'd read papers where we saw that there was ligand in there. And so they actually just waited. But it was kind of exciting, assuming our microscope wasn't broken. And we went around and started asking questions. And it turns out that actually there's a whole other group of plant biologists that do know that, that the lignin is located in the center. Uh, and so we had to sort of tell Chris about this whole set of literature. But uh, the reason I tell that story is it kind of points out that if even, even uh, right, your, your, own, your plant biologists aren't even talking to each other, uh, it kind of t gives you, tells you why you need to have a place like the foundry. Uh, where you really do need people with all sorts of expertise to talk to one another uh, so that you can begin to address some of these larger scale issues. Yeah. And people need to know what's out there and know what toolboxes uh, people have so that you can finally go in and, and investigate. So that's... But these images, you're not using the bow tie antenna, right? Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to uh, look at cell walls with the bow tie You know, no. So, so we haven't yet. That's really kind of our next, next step. And I think that's probably where, where I'll finish here with the promise of looking at plant cell walls with antennas. Um, so here again are some of the more even optical images we can get on plant cell walls, but like, a, like you said, these are actually relatively low resolution, at least relatively kind of small and meter sized things. The whole idea is that okay, we have these, these nearly ideal probes being photons, um, but we want to look at tiny things, and so how we're going to do it, hopefully, is now take the antenna tips that, that have been made here at the foundry and bring them down on top of the cell wall and begin to go around and do the optical spectroscopy. But this time, instead of with a 300 nanometer light spot, we're going to do it with a 10 nanometer light spot. And again, as sort of the question mark implies here, see if, if these models are really correct. And if not, uh, how, how to fix them so that they can then be broken down have much more efficient uh, alternative views. Great. Wow. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> my brain is full. Um, so we have, a, we have a couple of a couple of minutes. So I wanted to ask a Just a couple of fun questions to bring us back to, to the gun. Um, when asked what profession besides science they would choose for you, your mom said high finance or an entrepreneur, and your dad said an what profession, other than your own, would you like to try? That I like to try? Yeah, that's tough. Uh, I, uh, could I get paid like a banker, but, but surf? <laughs> <laughs> sure, professional <Sorry>. surfer. <laughs> uh, Robert McKee, the screenwriting coach, once said, why give your life to an idea that's not worth the idea being that you give so much of yourself to this idea, and you spend so much, so much of your time on it, you really have to believe in it. So, what do you see in nano optics and bow tie antennas that you really feel is worth your life? Well, I, I think that there's a lot of information. So I told you, I, I guess I've kind of always been a little obsessed with the whole idea of why, why, why are things behave as they do, uh, and so I think there's a lot of information. I feel there's a lot of uh, stuff that needs to be learned that can't be addressed any other way than, than for some of these techniques or the one that we're working on. And I think there, there are things that certainly can't be looked at at the same time. So in essence, we kind of need everything. All, all of these techniques are complementary to one another. But this is one that I like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I feel like there's a lot of problems. So um, I asked around. And here are some of the words people used to describe people. You can eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, so sincere, yeah. empathetic, amazing, good-hearted, extraordinarily smart, social. And your mom 
all of a sudden you're like a crystal with many different faces. Now, I have to say, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but I agree with everything that uh, I just read. So, so, so I want to... I've been fooling some people for a long time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for sitting down and talking to, to us today. And if anybody has any questions, Jim, this is your audience. Thanks.
at very much shorter wavelengths. So that's another way to beat the diffraction. Well, you're not beating the diffraction, but you're just able to focus X-rays in much smaller spots. The problem is that they have energies that are sort of in the uh, thousand electron volts, so a thousand times more energetic. You can imagine, again, same as with say, kind of like the electrons, when you ship hit uh, your sample with something that energetic, it can do damage. And it's not to say that visible light can't do damage. Obviously, we go outside and we get sunburned. So something's going on, but relatively speaking, it's much less. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this first ever in conversation with, and in particular, I would like everyone to thank Jim Shaw. Yeah, it's like a